Uh, welcome everyone to the webinar today. I am Hunter Montgomery, Chief Marketing Officer at Higher Logic. Today we're going to talk about the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR. We're excited to review a topic that has been top of mind for many people the last few months. Today we will cover what GDPR is, who it will impact, and the consequences of non-compliance, steps to prepare for the new regulation, and what tools Higher Logic will provide to help our clients be compliant. Our speaker today are Karen Newman, partner at the Goodwin Proctor Law Firm, and Ed English, Chief Product Officer at HireLogic. A little background on our speakers. Karen is a partner in Goodwin's business litigation group and a member of its privacy and cybersecurity practice. She is an internationally recognized privacy lawyer and former Chief Privacy Officer with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Ed is responsible for product management, user experience and design, and data analytics at HireLogic. He has over 15 years of product management experience, which includes leading product teams at DataMythic, APX, NetVMG, and Microsoft. Karen, great having you here today. Why don't you help us all understand what we need to know about GDPR? Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yes, I am here to talk about the GDPR, and we will just jump right into it. There's a lot of information that we have to give you. Um, let's get started. Um, so the General Data Protection Regulation is a new uh, Euro European Union-wide privacy law that enters into full force May 25th of this year. It was adopted actually about a year and a half ago, but regulators understanding that this was going to, that compliance was going to be a tall order for many companies, both European companies as well as global companies, essentially offered a grace period to allow a wide range of organizations and businesses to um, update their programs and align them, align their privacy programs with the requirements of the regulation. So it, the GDPR applies to businesses that process European personal data. And what does process mean? There is a, a number of, uh, there are a number of terms and nomenclature in the regulation and in European data privacy law that aren't familiar to most uh, U.S. businesses. And processing, the notion of processing is one of those terms. And essentially what it means is any activity involving the collection, use, sharing, manipulating, storage, um, transferring of uh, personal information. The GDPR applies to organizations that are established in the European Union. And it also applies to non-EU businesses that either provide goods and services in the European Union or um, monitor individual behavior. And by monitoring, we're not talking about NSA surveillance. We're talking about um, collecting large amounts of data and, and assessing that data for purposes such as targeted advertising. So, Chances are, if you're offering products or services in the European Union, you're probably subject to the GDPR. Um, the intent of the regulation was to harmonize the various privacy regulatory and legal frameworks of the 28 member um, Union, uh, European Union member states. So the, the impacts are essentially that it creates and enhances, um, it, it creates new and enhances existing data subject rights. Again, another term that may not be familiar to you, data subjects are essentially the way it sounds, individuals whose personal data is collected and processed. Um, it also expands territorial application of European privacy law along the lines I just described to non-EU um, organizations. And it expands and really enhances data governance obligations for businesses in the form of record keeping and um, maintaining uh, internal processes for um, responding to these new da data subject rights and internal processes that document um, essentially the entire realm of data processing activities. So a threshold question for any business that um, processes EU data is, am I subject, is your company subject to the GDPR? We do this assessment and if you are subject to the GDPR, compliance is um, should be top of mind because the consequences for violations or non-compliance are significant. Big fines up to 20 million uh, euros or up to 4% of global annual revenues. 
Um, the GDPR is based on a number of universally accepted fair information practice principles. Now, I'm not going to go through them all here in the interest of time, but many of these will be familiar to you. Transparency and choice, um, data minimization, um, retention limitation, and of course, confidentiality. And then the regulation also retains core concepts from the current uh, regime, and those concepts are the notion of a data controller and a data processor, and we're going to talk about those concepts in a few moments. But again, this, these concepts reflect um, nomenclature that's unfamiliar to U.S. organizations complying with U.S. privacy laws. Um, I mentioned data subject rights. The, um, the regulation retains a number of data subject rights, but offers um, new rights, which we'll also talk about. And then it applies special rules for automated decision making. Think of algorithm-based decisions for hiring, extending credit, or insurance coverage. So once you've decided that you are um, subject to the GDPR, the next important question is, are you a controller or are you a processor? And the reason these classifications are important is because all of the GDPR's obligations flow from the, the, the steps. So a data controller is, is you think of a data controller as a customer or an employer. It's an entity that makes decisions about how data is to be used and processed, and it instructs its data processors, think of those as service providers, via a data processing agreement. Um, a controller is liable for its own compliance and also for the compliance of its data processors. A data processor, on the other hand, as I indicated, is a service provider. Think of a processor as a service provider. Under uh, the GDPR, it acts um, pursuant to the controller's instructions, very explicit instructions in the data processing agreement. And although the, uh, the liability is, and the compliance obligations are theoretically less onerous than uh, the controller's obligations and liabilities under the GDPR, the controllers, due to the, the potential for significant fines, in all practical terms, slow down their obligations contractually. And so very often when we are working, when we're representing um, a service provider, we try to negotiate um, less onerous terms and it's, it's all dependent on the market power of the parties in the relationship. Um, so what are the obligations of a processor? Well, a processor has to implement um, reasonable security measures. There's no prescribed security measure. They're supposed to be reasonable for the sector that your organization is in um, and sort of what's market for that sector. Um, the security uh, measures also have to be tethered to related record keeping obligations so you can demonstrate that you've implemented appropriate measures. Uh, processors also have to, particularly non-EU based um, uh, processors, have to appoint an EU based representative meaning that they have to have a representative. It could be an individual. There's a new cottage industry that has sprung up as a result of the GDPR, and there are service providers that are, you know, EU-based representative as a service. Uh, but it has to be an entity that is, or an individual that is based in one of the EU member states in which processing activities take place. And the purpose of the representative is to be a point of contact for a regulator if they, if data subjects or uh, as I say, the regulators have an inquiry and they want to talk to um, someone in your company, the representative is a point of contact. Um, a DPO, a data uh, protection officer, is, is the GDPR's term for a chief privacy officer. Um, it's, not, it's an often misunderstood requirement. I'll talk about it a few slides down the road here. Uh, processors also need um, general or specific consent in these data processing agreements that I mentioned to hire a subcontractor. Um, we'll talk about that later on as well. Ob another obligation is there's a new breach notification law. Data processors don't have to notify the authorities, but they do have to notify their customer controllers because there's a tight time frame for the controllers within which to notify regulators. Uh, processors also have to comply with the very strict terms of data processing agreements, and um, our processors are subject to fines and private rights of action for non-compliance. So if you're getting, if you're a processor and you're getting ready for your, for GDPR compliance, we recommend taking a look at any existing data processing agreements, 
um, any contracts that extend beyond 2018 should be reviewed for GDPR compliant terms, and then assess liability and indemnity terms associated with um, data protection activities, data processing activities, and also take it take a look at your insurance policies for potentially um, relevant coverage. Um, controllers have other obligations, and this is again the heavy lift. They, they're the ones that are responsible for the transparency. They have to have a GDPR compliant privacy policy. They also have to comply with the core data processing principles that I, I displayed on the earlier slide. Um, they have to put in place processes and procedures through their processors to honor individual uh, data subject rights, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. They all, unlike uh, the U.S. concept they, uh, or framework, controllers have to have a legal basis for the processing. What does that mean? We'll talk about it later, but essentially it means consent um, or necessity to perform a contract or some other legal obligation. Controllers may also have to conduct a privacy impact assessment and consult with data processing authorities when required under the GDPR. Um, so controllers should also be looking, performing a comprehensive assessment of, the, of their current policies and practices and do a gap analysis um, and then uh, implement measures to comply with the GDPR. Here's a snapshot, a visual, to help you understand what the various obligations are. You'll see on this slide that there are a number of control controller and processor obligations, so obligations that apply to both. I'm not going to go through the whole list here. You can use this as a reference, but um, I thought a visual would be helpful to uh, demonstrate what I've been talking about. I mentioned a legal basis for data processing. Uh, companies can't just decide to collect data because they can. They have to, again, have a legal basis for doing so. Typically, it has been consent. But consent is often difficult to prove, and since the GDPR is all about putting the data subject in the driver's seat and control what's being done with their information and even the ability to collect information, the rules around consent have been kind of have been tightened a little bit. And so now what, what is required if consent is going to be a legal basis, some sort of affirmative action. So on a website, if, if, informa if personal information is going to be collected on a website, you have to have an unchecked box, can't be pre-checked, can't say, you know, unchecked if you don't want us to do this. Instead, there has to be an affirmative showing of uh, consent and checking an unchecked box is considered to be such, a, such an affirmative action. When we are talking about certain categories of data, like sensitive data, um, consent has to be explicit. And what that means is it's the, the notification or the inf being informed about the collection and use and processing of sensitive data um, may be more enhanced than the uh, regular disclosures, and so the, the consent, the corresponding consent, would be explicit and tied to the enhanced notifications. I mentioned that um, consent can be withdrawn at any time, and so that's a downside for uh, for uh, relying on consent. It also has to be given freely and for specific purposes. The notion of being given freely makes it pretty unlikely to be relied on in the employment context and also in the context of analytics because in the context of analytics, it's difficult for data subjects to exercise their rights. So they can't um, ask, uh, it's regarded as a, as a difficult scenario for a data subject to, say, to ask a controller, I want to see what personal data of mine is being folded into the data, the aggregated data that you're using for analyst, analytics, untangle my data from everyone else's. That's considered a challenge, and therefore, consent is probably not um, likely to be a valid basis in the analytics context. I mentioned the legitimate interest. Um, a, uh, there's a, a balancing act that has to come into play here. A, a business's legitimate interest cannot outweigh the fundamental um, individual right to having a their personal privacy, including with respect to their data. And so the legitimate interest has to be explained in a privacy policy. You know, in addition to the disclosure, uh, there's literally a statement that has to be included in the privacy policy that says our legitimate interest in collecting and using your data is to, and then name that legitimate interest. Um, another legal basis is necessity to perform a contract. Many service providers, um, you know, have are integral, integrally linked to their customers, 
in terms of the data that they process and if they can't, if they have to get consent or if they have to um, rely on some other basis for collecting the data or processing the data, it would be impossible to perform the contract. I mentioned new individual data subject rights. Uh, many of you may have heard of the right to be forgotten or the right to deletion. This is a misunderstood right in many respects because it's not absolute for controllers. Um, it is subject to certain ex exceptions. The notion of freedom of, of expression, legal claims, the ability of the public to access information may, under certain circumstances, outweigh an individual's right in, in their request to be forgotten. And so the, a balancing act has to take place. And however you land, particularly if you land on, no, thank you, we're not going to delete this, um, you have to document the analysis and the decision. For example, it, uh, companies may need to retain information for regulatory reporting purposes, or if they're in the middle of a lawsuit, or some other sort of claim, that interest may outweigh the individual's interest. Um, I mentioned that the data, uh, excuse me, the GDPR puts data subjects in the driver's seat, and so it's the regulation is all about transparency. It's also all about record keeping. Uh, businesses and organizations have to keep records of their data processing activities and all of the decision making around that, particularly uh, decisions where you are refraining, you're deciding not to um, implement a certain um, aspect of the, of the regulation. Data portability is another um, new individual right uh, for those requests. Um, data has to be given in machine-readable form. It only applies with a legal basis for the processing of consent or performance of a contract. Um, individuals have a right to object to automated um, decisions. Again, decisions that are based on the use of algorithms for hiring and extending credit. Uh, businesses have to respond to these requests within a month. So typically what would happen is uh, a controller would get, or a customer might get a request. They might have to pass it to their service provider. The service provider would have a certain amount of time, probably set in the data processing agreement, for um, obtaining the information or deciding whether or not, you know, following the controller's instructions with respect to whether or not they should um, uh, give that information. And then the, they would pass it to the controller. The controller, if they decided to give the information to the uh, customer or end user would, would then do so. Um, so it's important to have in place internal processes for responding to these requests. Review whatever processes you have already. Staff training is going to be really important here. Employees have to know what to do when these requests come in. And, then, and of course, uh, there has to be an understanding of in which IT systems this data might reside or will reside. And then make any necessary changes to um, address these rights. Um, the, the GDPR also calls for a data protection officer for controllers and processors, but again, this is a misunderstood, quote, requirement because uh, it's not mandatory. It's only mandatory under specific circumstances. For example, if uh, a business engages in large-scale, regular, and systematic monitoring, as I uh, described earlier, or if it engages in large-scale processing of sensitive data, health, biometrics, or criminal offense data. The role of the DPO is to counsel uh, its organization and monitor for GDPR compliance. Uh, the DPO has to be an expert in data privacy um, law and particularly the European framework in the GDPR. Um, they have to be independent, so they can't get instructions from the board of directors, for example, and they can't be fired for doing their job. Uh, there also shouldn't be a conflict of interest, so you wouldn't want the chief marketing officer or the chief financial officer to also serve as the DPO. Again, if you decide not to hire a data protection officer, it's important to document the basis for that decision making. So if there is an ever, if, if the regulators ever want to know, well, why don't you have any, a DPO? You can demonstrate that you went through a thoughtful analysis, you, you consider the criteria and, and reach the decision you reached. Privacy impact assessments, again, a controller obligation for high-risk activities. Uh, we recommend that this take place before um, or early in the, at the product design stage or before a new service is being rolled out because it's difficult to retrofit a product or service once we've gone down that road. So um, again, it's not, it's only, it's mandatory in certain instances. If uh, 
as a result of conducting the privacy impact assessment, it is apparent that any privacy risks that have been identified can't be mitigated. Um, controllers are required to confer with a, D, a, a DPA, their DPA, and uh, this can be tricky because DPAs have up to 14 weeks to issue an opinion, and processing of that data will be delayed for that duration. So, identify products early in the development process that are likely to pose a high risk, and consider developing a PIA questionnaire for use by project leaders to facilitate the process and make it more efficient. Um, the GDPR imposes a new obligation on all organizations involving data breaches. There's a data breach uh, reporting requirement now, which will be unfamiliar to many European companies. It applies to both controllers and processors, but it, the obligations are different depending on whether uh, uh, you're operating, as a, you're functioning as a controller or a processor. Controllers have a tight turnaround. They've got to notify the DCA within 72 hours of being made aware of the breach if it's likely to result in risk to individuals. Well, what does that mean? Uh, there's, there's not a lot of guidance out there, but you can um, infer that that basically means is there a risk of, of harm like identity theft? Um, who should be not notified? The DPA of the European uh, member state where the controller is established if it's established in the EU. Data subjects don't always have to be notified, but they do need to be notified in the event of a high risk. Um, in that instance, they should be notified without undue delay, but it's unclear. There's not been guidance issues yet what undue de delay is. And it, it's not require, required in all instances. So for example, if data is encrypted, um, uh, data subject notification may not be required. Um, so processors, if there's a breach in a service provider's um, system processors have to notify controllers without undue delay, but it's unclear what that is. And so this is something that's usually hashed out during contract negotiations. So since the, the controllers are going to be really worried about that 72-hour time frame, and they're going to try to insist that they be notified by their service providers within 12 to 24 hours, maybe less than 12 hours. Service providers are going to want, want to make sure they get it right. And sometimes the breach that you encounter at 10 o'clock in the morning isn't the same breach that you're looking at at one o'clock in the afternoon. So they're going to negotiate for the, the longest period of time possible to make sure that they understand the incident, they understand if actually data was accessed, and they want to make sure that all of the accurate information is being provided to their controllers. And so they may try to negotiate for a 24 to 36 hour time frame, arguing that um, it's in their customer's interest for the their, the processors to get it right the first time so there doesn't have to be a lot of back and forth. It's important to review incident response plans, gender agreements, cyber risk insurance policies, and employee training to ensure that the reporting obligations can be complied with and that um, you understand the contractual terms that, and make sure they're aligned with the new obligation and that um, your, the cyber risk insurance policies contemplate the, the new uh, requirements under the GDPR. It's also important to consider the impact of global mandatory breach notification laws. In the United States, we have 48 states with breach notification laws, and it may not be necessary to notify each one, even though notifications might be required under the GDPR. And there are actually significant considerations because once you notify, the media gets uh, a hold of the notification, and there may be a lot of consternation among customers or investors, and so it's important to think about how to how these uh, notification regimes are interoperable and what your response plan is going to be. Um, the GDPR refers to data mapping and data inventory, but it's, again, this is not a mandatory requirement. No one's going to get fined for failing to data map, but they will get fined for not having appropriate records of their processing activities. So data mapping is actually very important and useful for preparing for maintain, creating and maintaining GDPR required records of processing activities and for complying with individual requests. Because if you know in which every nook and cranny in your system's personal data lies, it makes it much easier to respond to those requests, whether they're coming from a customer or a regulator. It's also important, it's, data mapping is also useful for understanding whether a data transfer mechanism may be required for transferring personal information from 
Europe to the United States, for example, or if data should be stored in country, for example, on servers located in Russia or China. So at a minimum, we recommend that you assess how personal data is obtained, um, for example, directly from an end user or from third-party sources, what's the legal basis for the processing, with whom personal data is shared and why, where, how and where personal data is stored and secured, and to which non-European economic area countries personal data is transferred. Now, I mentioned that the GDPR um, intent, you know, the goal of the GDPR was to harmonize all of the European privacy frameworks. That said, it's not entirely the case. So I just want you to be aware that in certain instances, member states can enhance uh, compliance obligations, um, and they can do so in the context of national security, um, preventing uh, crime or prosecuting crime, uh, certain other public interests. They can also enhance obligations in the context of uh, employee data, uh, genetic, biometric, or health data, um, um, journalistic activity, and then certain um, requirements for children. For example, the GDPR sets the age of uh, parental consent at 16, but many uh, member states are looking at the U.S. requirement for um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which sets the, the age at um, under 13. And so we may be looking at a similar approach in some member states. Um, I mentioned data transfers. Uh, many of you may be aware that it's illegal to transfer personal data from, uh, not from the European Union to non European economic area countries that have that are seen as lacking adequate privacy protection. So it's okay to transfer uh, personal data from Europe to certain whitelisted countries because they've been granted adequacy findings by the European Commission. So Argentina, Canada, Israel, and Switzerland transfers to these countries are okay. You don't need a mechanism. Japan and South Korea, as we speak are negotiating with the European Commission for an adequacy finding, and we'll see um, how, that, how that plays out. Um, the mechanisms that are available are either the EU, U.S., and Swiss uh, privacy shields, U.S. Uh, privacy shields, we'll talk about that in a moment, standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules, and then the GDPR contemplates approved codes of conduct or certifications um, administered by industry self-regulatory groups uh, like we have in the United States, but they're not in place yet. Right now, um, the European Commission and industry trade groups are having discussions about what those codes of conduct might look like, and they may include some sort of certification for cross-border uh, data transfers, but we don't know what those look like, and they're not available yet, but you should definitely be paying attention to developments in that area to see if um, those uh, if, if there are new, if the new options are more favorable than the existing options. We're often asked about Brexit. What's going to be the, ex the um, impact on the transfer of personal data from the UK to the European Union after 2019? Uh, right now, the UK has been teeing up an adequacy finding to avoid such transfer restrictions. They've been working really closely to demonstrate that they're going to have a very GDPR-like regime. But if the discussions break down or if something unexpected happens, I think you might be looking at, you might expect um, a UK-US uh, privacy shield framework or something similar. So the privacy shield, just really quickly here, um, it went into effect, the US one, uh, shield went into effect July 2016. The Swiss version, which is virtually identical, went into effect in April of 2017. It's a voluntary self-certification framework under which U.S. companies agree to comply with principles that undergird European Union uh, privacy law and certain other requirements. And so it's very much tilted in favor of the EU privacy framework, and it's intended to ensure European data subjects and European regulators that any data transferred to the United States will be adequately protected. Um, it only applies to companies that are subject to U.S. Federal Trade Commission or Department of Transportation jurisdiction, and so far, upwards of 2,500 companies have already certified. Um, it is subject to pending legal challenges, 
and we await the outcome of those um, of those decisions uh, expected in in 2018 now. We, we were initially expecting a decision at the end of last year, but it hasn't uh, been issued yet. Binding corporate rules are another option. They apply more broadly. Uh, they're not just limited to EU-US transfers. These are contract clauses that are approved by the European Commission. They're only available for B2B <coughs> transfers, whereas the privacy shield applies to consumer to business transfers as well. Um, Unlike the privacy shield, if you go this route, you will be subject to a European data protection authority jurisdiction versus FTC jurisdiction, and it's something you'll have to consider as you're deciding which mechanism to use, whether you prefer FTC jurisdiction or EU DPA jurisdiction. These clauses are not non-negotiable. You have to take them or leave them, um, uh, and they also are being challenged right now. Um, we, we, again, we await uh, the court judgment. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're valid right now. There's no reason not to use them, but you should be aware that they're also the subject of a legal challenge. The other uh, valid mechanism for um, inter uh, cross-border data transfers are binding corporate rules, which are available, <clears throat> excuse me, only for intra-group transfers for large global multinational companies. They have to be approved by a regulator. They, it subjects the company to EU uh, DPA jurisdiction. It takes a long time to get these rules approved, and it's pretty costly. You've got to involve a law firm, um, and these, although it's unlikely, we think these rules could potentially be challenged as well. So, what to expect after May 25th, 2018? We get a lot of questions from our clients. Are they are the regulators immediately going to start bringing enforcement actions? Should we be, should we be wor worried? What's May 26th going to look like? So what we think um, the, the landscape is going to look like after May 25th is we think that there won't be an immediate rush to full-on enforcement action. Um, the nuclear option is not going to be implemented right out of the gate. We think that you may see some uh, enforcement actions for really egregious abuses, you know, massive data breaches, breaches um, wholesale noncompliance and disregarding of the of the GDPR. Other options could be warning letters to companies, requests to inspect records. So in terms of prioritizing tasks for your GDPR compliance program, uh, putting in place a framework for record keeping is really important. And you may get a request for meetings with a DPA. Um, we think there will, we can expect ongoing DPA guidance uh, through opinions that have been issued over the last year or so, and also obviously through enforcement activity. We think that um, just like an FTC enforcement action, any enforcement activity will send a clear signal or hopefully a clearer signal about some of the ambiguous terms of the GDPR. And again, we can expect interpretive opinions, best practices, and other kinds of guidance. I mentioned the development of industry self-regulatory codes. Um, it, we expect industry input through their trade associations and through conversations with um, regulators in the European Commission um, that might um, be a safe harbor from full-on enforcement. And that's the overview of the GDPR. Great. Hi, everyone. This is Ed English. I'm the Chief Product Officer at HireLogic. And at HireLogic, we make software that helps companies create user communities where people find information, get answers to questions, they interact with each other, they actively participate in a bunch of different ways. Uh, we also provide automation and communication tools that these organizations can use to, to, to talk directly to their customers, partners, and members. So this is something um, we do for tens of millions of people every day. So handling user data and enforcing privacy policies is the central thing our products were built to do. So the upcoming GDPR regulations articulate a number of specific obligations, and Karen has pointed out you know, a lot of these things. Uh, but the principles that it's built on are not new, uh, new to us. In many respects, the continuation and reinforcement of existing business policies, business practices, and, and technology that our, our products are, are built on. Um, so first, I want to set the stage for how I think about GDPR. And overall, in, in my opinion, the intent of the regulations aren't to stop, limit, or change the legitimate engagement you have with your members or, or end users. Uh, I believe that while the regulations apply to everyone serving EU citizens, 
the real intent is to address the bad actors who are misusing data, misleading users, and blatant disregard for, uh, for the rules. So in that vein, as long as you have the right controls in place and are delivering a valuable experience to your customers, then GDPR should essentially be a non-issue for you on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. I have a couple of slides that will talk about the controls and capabilities we offer inside our products to accomplish that. But before we dig into features, there's one important point that affects uh, everything else. It's the choice of data you collect on your users and what systems have access to it. And you may have a real need to track sensitive data inside your CRM or other business applications, but in the context of community and marketing automation systems, you should not be loading, storing, or syncing things like social security numbers, driver's license, credit cards, date of birth, or similar items, uh, of course. And there's a number of sensitive data attributes that GDPR calls out specifically. You know, things like ethnic origin, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, health-related items uh, among them. And these demand really close scrutiny to ensure that you have a legitimate uh, reason to collect. Uh, note that foundations, associations, and not-for-profits may have more leeway in this regard compared to commercial enterprises. But either way, it's really the first thing uh, you need to address, uh, and it's super important. And again, even if you do capture it, doesn't mean you should necessarily put it into a community or marketing system. A good rule of thumb is to not include things that uh, the users themselves wouldn't share with someone else on their profile. So lastly, GDPR preparation doesn't have to be a purely compliance check the box kind of project. I look at it as a positive opportunity to ensure that you've implemented efficient operations. It's a good time to review policies and terms and conditions you might not have looked at uh, in a while. And it's especially a good time to to really push engagement best practices which will improve your customer's experience with you. And again, that's the, the main objective of what you're trying to accomplish for your users, and that's the main, I guess, defense against bad things happening in the, in the context of GDPR. And if you're gonna do some work anyway, you should get the best return from it uh, that you can. Along with a bunch of other applications you probably use, like your CRM or AMS or trouble ticketing applications or whatever, uh, we're one of your data processors. This means that we handle your data according to your instructions. And these instructions are included in the terms of service and the agreements that we have together uh, as a customer and supplier. But they're also implemented in practice uh, when you tell us what you want us to do through administrative application features that we expose to you in our product. So in this sense, products themselves aren't GDPR compliant. It's how you use the products that can be compliant or not. So in addition to providing you with features to implement your solutions in a compliant way, there are a bunch of related plumbing level technology items uh, we do. And they're, they're important because GDPR regulations spell those out as uh, obligations uh, of a processor. Uh, and we take these very seriously. The first is we invest a lot in our security infrastructure. It's one of the real benefits of working with a company like Hyrologic. You have thousands of customers, tens of millions of users, billions of interactions every month which means we're at scale. Then we have a modern cloud-based technology stack, so we can invest in the right architecture and the latest solutions. We regularly do external security uh, penetration tests. We work with consultants and experts to ensure that we have great right operational practices uh, in place. So this is something super important to us, uh, and we put a lot of energy into it. Also under the hood, we log data for analysis, verification, and, and tracking purposes. Uh, Karen mentioned you know, plenty of times that, that tracking and data and record keeping is really important, uh, and, uh, and, and we do that as part of our, our application environment. And these are system level things that help us ensure that the application is performing as intended. We use this for automated alerts, as well as for triage and forensics in the case that there's something that needs to be looked into uh, in more detail. And finally, as a processor, if there's something problematic or amiss, uh, we'll notify you. We know that there's timelines associated with that. Uh, so we'll not only notify you, but we'll provide you with the information you might need in turn to communicate with uh, end users or other parties uh, who you might be interacting with. So, so that's what our role is uh, as, as a processor that uh, corresponds to the things that Karen has already pointed out. So there's a number of capabilities in our products today that allow you to manage aspects of data privacy and access control. Uh, most of you already uh, use these tools, but I wanted to highlight them just so you're aware of what you can do uh, now. So first, 
providing your customers with information that spells out your terms of service is a basic feature uh, we've had a, for a long while. The terms and conditions and privacy policy specific language uh, is yours, but we, we give you the ability to configure it, define that text, define what it is, track the acceptance of it, determine where it shows up and who needs to see it. So for example, you can make this a hard gating item. For example, you can make users accept these terms on first login. You can disallow email replies and other actions until they accept uh, these, uh, these terms and conditions, uh, for example. You can also make it module specific, so you can block access to certain pages or certain features uh, within our applications until there's an acceptance of some unique terms uh, as well, if you choose to, to do that. Contact Us uh, is also a configurable setting, which can be set up uh, to use uh, a form, for example, so customers can reach out to you with specific issues, questions, uh, or requests. So in terms of privacy policy, this is a, a really important point. You know, we give community users the direct ability to see, edit, and manage all of their personal profile information. So all of the items in a user's profile page, for example, respect the privacy settings. And these are set with global default values that, that you define, but the user can override these default values uh, for each of their attributes. So they can decide if they want to share their certifications, for example, uh, with different uh, populations within the application so they can share them publicly with only members of the community, only their accepted contacts, or with no one else at all if they, they choose to do that. Users can also opt out of the directory so they can't be found by other user, users if they choose uh, that route. They can set up, include, or ex exclude discussion signatures so that they can limit what level of personal data is attached uh, in each post. Also, some communities are set up for anonymous posting. So in these cases, there's no connection uh, to the content back to an individual's profile. And uh, finally, the users today can see their contribution history, which is kind of logged also in part of their profile, so that they can view it and edit. So all of their items, posts, blogs, library entries, and, and so on. So basically today, all of your users have very fine-grained control over all of their personal profile information and all of their contributed content. So we give you tons of admin tools to control things uh, to access uh, the application. So we have a, a variety of administrative roles and granular permission structure kind of baked into the product. So this involves settings on what fields you can display to other admins. So we have different tiers of administrative users in our system and you can control who can see what, both on screen uh, or in reports. So we, we also have an, an admin function we call impersonation. This allows an admin to log in as a, as a different role. And so this is an important for doing things like testing dynamic and personalized content, since we can show or hide things on individual pages based upon what security group someone is in. So this impersonation has sp specific terms and conditions that admins need to agree to. All the activities logged and the notifications are automatically sent when impersonation occurs. But this is, some, this is a feature you can disable uh, altogether. Also within uh, the admin kind of privacy and access control settings, we give you the, the ability to manage access to your data by HireLogic staff. And if the access is permitted for testing and troubleshooting, let's say, the notifications are provided to you so you can track it. And of course, you can revoke or change uh, this access uh, if you wish. So email is an important communication channel and one that needs to be actively managed. The key, of course, is to deliver concentrated, high-value, personally relevant content. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't be sending the email in the first place. So we think it's important to give both admins and users control over the email experience. In terms of admin email configurations, we give you a variety of options around subscribing rules to community notifications and emails, in particular including whether you want to enable or disable auto subscriptions. We also give you tools to disallow email posting or replies until the terms and conditions are accepted and uh, to handle those customers whose primary participation is through their email client versus a web page. The user themselves can modify the email preferences at any time. They can opt out of all the notifications or they can choose to get them in real time, choose a digest option, uh, whichever they prefer. We also have a feature called automation rules, which trigger actions and 
with conditional logic based on some event happening in the system. Basically, it takes the form of if this happens, then do that action. So you can use these rules to manage a number of things, like managing email list participation, uh, security groups, and, uh, and so on. So today, there's an option for our top level role, which we call super admins, to see an admin only tab that shows up on the user's profile. And from there, they can disable a user's account. Admins can also moderate and delete individual posts and content submitted by users. So together, this allow admins to remove users and content uh, from the system for any individual user, albeit manually. So users, you know, you can also give users the option to disable themselves. You know, if the feature is activated, then a user can go to their profile and disable the account. This feature can be turned on or off depending upon whether you want to uh, enable this uh, for, uh, for, your, uh, for your customers. But uh, just note, this doesn't remove any of the historic content contributed by that user uh, automatically, it doesn't do that. And most of our customers are integrated with a CRM or AMS application. So it's also worth noting that removing the user from higher logic does not remove them from the upstream systems. Um, and it also doesn't prevent you from adding them back to the systems uh, later as a, as a brand new user. So what are we working on for the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months in preparation for GDPR to improve these administrative features. Well, some of the things that I'm gonna talk through are in motion already, some are being evaluated, uh, but they haven't yet been deployed in, in the product. But we wanted to share with you some of these future items so you can understand the kinds of things that we're, we're looking into. So today, uh, as an admin, I mentioned that you can manually disable accounts and delete content for a user. But to improve upon that experience, we're going to enable a method where you can submit a deletion request uh, for uh, an individual user. And this will remove the user's PII, things like email, name, address, demographic fields, uh, and so on. Uh, this will allow you to, to choose to delete the content that they've contributed, like posts, files, blogs, comments, and things. And we're also considering an option where the user's PII will be deleted, but their historic content will remain but will not be associated with them individually. We call that anonymization. We're also creating a query and report that you can submit to get a data audit request uh, set of content for an individual. That data audit will include the PII and the historic interaction data we've associated with that person. And the goal of this report is to provide you with a way to download individual level data that you might need to comply with a, a data access uh, request. There's a couple of dimensions to programmatic interactions with privacy and compliance features I want to address as well. The first relates to interactions with upstream contact record sources. So we're working to tap into a do not email function that's stored in a few different AMS and CRM uh, applications. Uh, and secondly, we're looking into a sync block list of what we would consider to be users record keys so that we can reject uh, someone if there's an unintended push of a contact record uh, into higher logic. So for example, if you don't, you, you won't be able to accidentally reinstate someone who you just deleted. We're also investigating the ability to, and, and the level of customer interest in an API that will allow you, your other applications to query for consent, verification, or to modify communication settings. So as I mentioned before, automation rules are a super powerful way to define and enforce business policies within your community. We're working on rules to create suppression or opt-out email actions that you can enforce using a variety of criteria. For example, to suppress uh, or opt-out email to members based upon the country field in their profile, for example. And we have a full-featured content management system inside of HireLogic that customers use to build web pages of all types, private community pages, as well as public-facing pages. And we're looking to create a set of simple widgets and site settings to facilitate capturing consent uh, on particular items. We already do this uh, for accepting application terms and conditions, and we're gonna add to that, uh, that capabilities around different types of email opt-ins, as well as uh, cookie acknowledgements. So, so that's it for today's overview of privacy features, uh, what we have in the product today, where we're headed uh, in the near term. So for additional info and ongoing updates, please uh, use Hug, which is our user community as the, the go-to place. And with that, we may have time for a question or two. Thanks, Ed. Yes, we do. We uh, have collected a number of questions over the last 45 minutes. 
I can't get to them all, obviously, but we will summarize. We will summarize a few themes and topics. So the first one, and this may be more for Karen. Um, so my company is small. Do I have to comply with GDPR? That's a great question. It's one that we get all the time. And I, I guess the headline is the GDPR doesn't differentiate between the 17 year old in their parents' garage, who is a essentially a global company because they, the 17 year old's app collects information from all over the world or the large multinational. Um, but if that the small company um, has you know 250 employees or less, carries out processing that's likely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects and the and the um, processing is not incidental or occasional, chances are that the GDPR is going to apply. On the other hand, if the processing is incidental, the triggers aren't really met, um, chan you know, you may be able to overcome the requirements of the GDPR. Great. All right, another topic that was, um, had a lot of questions came in. What is the difference between personal and sensitive data? Good question because uh, those terms are used interchangeably a lot. Personal data is essentially any data that's linked or linkable or can be linked to an individual. So it's any information relating to an identified uh, or identifiable natural person. Uh, and I, you may ask, what's an identifiable natural person? It's a person who can be identified directly or indirectly through um, a particular piece of obvious information like an email address or through pieces of information that could be com uh, combined to identify that individual, such as a name, an identification number, location data, an online identif uh, identifier, or one or more other factors that are very specific and unique to a, per a person's you know, physical or physiological um, um, uh, characteristics. Sensitive data, on the other hand, this is just a, a different form of personal data. Under the GDPR, sensitive data can reveal racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious, religious or philo philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, and data concerning um, lifestyle preferences, health, uh, sexual preferences, sexual orientation, genetic data, or biometric data. Great. All right, I think we have time for one last question, and this is around um, kind of preparing, getting prepared. What documents should my organization have prepared and available? So, well, one of the things that we think is uh, essential for all of our customers is to make sure that they have a very clear and well thought out uh, terms, uh, terms and conditions that they use to enforce um, uh, all of their users to accept before using the uh, using the higher logic applications. They need to have a well thought out and reviewed privacy policy. Uh, in addition, that there's going to be different types of uh, terms and conditions that uh, groups of uh, users um, will be subject to within higher logic. So you will have different terms and conditions for admins that have different access rights uh, than other types of uh, community members. So the the first two uh, things that should be um, on your review list is your terms and conditions and privacy policy and all the documentation that uh, that goes that goes with that. And then, secondly, and Karen has mentioned this before, which is GDPR is a is is an opportunity for for us to make sure that we're collecting uh, and tracking the the processing of the data in you know, in a in a good uh, compliant way. So record keeping is a, is a theme here. So so in addition to the the documents that you show to end users in the application, uh, you should document and do your data mapping exercise and and ensure that you're uh, tracking uh, in a compliant way how you process uh, your user and customer data. Great, thanks, Ed. So we still have a number of questions we don't have time to answer today. We will post those on a blog on our website. Um, we'll also post the recording of this webinar in the next few days. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to Karen and Ed for talking and giving us more information. Everyone have a great afternoon.